Reintroduction of rotos looms as government proposes increase in charges. Individual bondholders give government 48 hour ultimatum to pay matured bonds. Meanwhile, government commences payment on outstanding bonds. Later tonight, the Ghana National Association of Teachers and the Coalition of Consent Teachers heads back at the Education Minister, urging him to rather provide adequate resources to non-performing schools than close them down. In business news, government to announce payment of bonds that matured during the debt exchange. We have details for you shortly. And elsewhere on the international front, at least 190 people now confirmed dead in Malawi after Storm Freddy. We've got details of all these stories, plus many more coming up in the next 60 minutes. Remember, we're streaming live on Facebook. We're also live on your DSTV channel 279. You can join us with your views, comments, and suggestions on any of our top stories this hour. Let us know what you make of them on Facebook, on Twitter. We promise to share them with the rest of the world. We begin from Parliament, where the Chairman of the Road and Transport Committee, Kennedy Osenyako, says any amount less than five cities for the road toll will be fiercely resisted. But the minority is pushing for broader consultation that will have the rate generally accepted by all. Komla Kluches reports from Parliament. As a chair of a committee for roads and transport, I have not had any discussion. There hasn't been any discussion or, uh, I mean, we haven't been uh, informed about the proposed rate for the reintroduction of the two. I have always made a stance that if government want to do reintroduction of the two, we have to just bite the bullet and fix a rate that will be commensurable or will be able to raise enough revenue to solve our road problems because I don't see the reason why if a rate was one CD and now you, after uh, some years you want to put it one CD 50 pesos, to me, I think it is inadequate. Already, the chairman of the Roads and Transport Committee of Parliament, Kennedy Oseinyako, is indicating that he will not approve of anything less than five cities as a road toll. So after several, after suspending the road toll for more more than a year, and you are adding just 50 pesos to it, then why do we could have as well go ahead to maintain the one city and add, uh, uh, whilst we are collecting the one city, we could have made a proposal and add 50 pesos to it. But if you come and uh, you said you have uh, suspended it and you want to add, for me, as a road chair, I will not support anything less than five cities. And I'm saying it based on the fact that the average road toll in the sub-region, even globally, is $1. What is $1? How much is $1 today? Okay? So if you're able to raise five, if it is five CD, we are short of raising not less than a billion Ghana CD. Do you know what a billion Ghana CD can do? It can do so many things on our road. On the side of the minority, anything less than a broader consultation on the matter will not be entertained or countenanced. I think this is a, a, a sad situation. Uh, he claimed 78 million cities a, a year is not enough. Uh, I can tell you that people who have weeded roadsides uh, are, are, are with feeder roads and other things whose bills at uh, road fund currently, some old as little as 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 20,000 cities who are not being paid. And they're in their thousands. A 78 million Ghana city would have cleared a chunk of those people's bills. We will support this if the discussion is broad-based, includes all stakeholders, but we are not going to support this just to create an, another revenue stream into the general pool of government for them to use to pay for very unnecessary things like cathedral and others. We will not support it. I, I know there has been some general understanding that based on the inflation and other things, 
I've heard people in the public say that, look, if you drive V8 and they charge you five CDs to cross the motorway, they don't care. Because if you can drive V8, you should be able to pay. I am of the view that, of course, we all know that in, in uh, the makeup of the public uh, means that some people are better off in terms of resources. So obviously they can pay. I mean, uh, but then it may be Uber and uh, the, the transportation that takes care of ordinary people. We can look at how they, they charge so that it, it, the cost is not passed on heavily onto those ones. But if somebody decides to sit in his very expensive car alone driving around and he's charged whatever amount, I don't think the public should be worried about that. Well, as to whether this would bring in the necessary revenue that government needs in as much as it's seeking an IMF bailout, it remains an unanswered question regarding what government is seeking to do. Komla Kluche. TV3 News, Parliament House, Accra. Meanwhile, government has served notice for the reintroduction of the payment of tolls on selected roads and highways. The finance minister, in a letter addressed to the sector ministry, has proposed new rates when processes for its resumption are completed. In November 2021, the finance minister, Ken Oforiata, announced the cancellation of road toll collection, citing congestion and traffic jams at toll booths as a reason for the decision. The government has abolished all tolls on public roads and bridges. The toll collection personnel will be reassigned, the expected impact on productivity and reduce environmental pollution. The roads minister followed up with a press release directing the cessation of the collection of road and bridge tolls nationwide. He also said this. We want to refurbish all those uh, toll boot stretches to provide you know, proper and decent washrooms, for instance, for you know, uh, the use by motorists. This move was criticized amid agitations and oppositions from various groups. So those are policy proposals that the police have presented to the House. Until they are approved, nobody, and I mean nobody, has the authority to start implementing something that doesn't exist. There is no such law for him to operationalize. There is no such law. The law we have now has imposed the fees that they have been collecting. Due to revenue shortfalls from the e-levy, the finance minister in the 2023 budget presentation announced the reintroduction of road tolls, this time not across the country, but on selected roads. The speaker of this nature will be told. Uh, Honourable Minister, Honourable Minister, resume your seat. Mr. Speaker, the completed new road will be told to recover the whole life cost of the completed infrastructure as well as pay lenders and provide a return to equity investors. After this, the roads minister came up to clarify that the reintroduction of the policy will affect only roads constructed under public-private partnerships. We woke up on Tuesday to a new memo from the finance minister addressed to the roads ministry announcing new amount to be paid as road and bridge tolls. This is, however, pending the completion of steps to identify the roads and highways to be affected. But as it stands, the proposal is for a composite average of 88.05% increase across board. Heavy buses will not pay two cities. Cars will pay one city instead of the previous 50 pesos. Pickup of 4x4 vehicles will also pay one city 50 pesos. One thing that has not stood out clearly is the specific roads that fall under the PPP project. Many have requested a list of roads and highways to be affected under the new policy. Meanwhile, some experts have described the new rates as inadequate and have also suggested a digitized mode of collection. To them, the human element should be taken out and we should rather focus on automation. Christian Yale, TV3 News, 
Accra. In other news tonight, pension bondholders have expressed concerns and disappointment over the failure by government to honor its promise to pay investors their mature coupons on bonds that were included in the domestic debt were not included in the domestic debt exchange program. Now, convener of the bondholders forum, Dr. Edu Anani Entry says by close of March 13, no investor had received payments due them. Nobody will be punished. All coupons will be honored in the same way the contracts were signed. These were the words of Finance Minister Ken Oforiata during a press briefing with aggrieved pension bondholders who had picketed at the premises of the ministry to demand exemption from the domestic debt exchange program on February 17. Almost a month on, however, government is yet to make payments for coupons and matured principals, the second time the finance ministry has failed to honor payments due February 6 and 20. In a statement signed by a convener of the bondholders forum, Dr. Edu Ananinchi, the group gave a 48-hour ultimatum to the Ministry of Finance to honor its word to pay all matured principal and outstanding coupons due on the existing bonds issued. The group cited an earlier press release from the ministry assuring members of the forum that payment of coupons and principles of old bonds would resume by March 13 to bondholders who did not tender their bonds. So we're joined on the phone lines by convener of the Pension Bondholders Forum, Dr. Edu Anani Entry. Thank you very much, sir, for your time and good to have your news 360. Uh, we know that government had given a deadline uh, to, be, to resume payment of your bonds, your matured bonds. It was the 13th, that was yesterday. And as you've rightly indicated, you've still not received payments. Have you had any engagement with government on this matter? Well, thank you. No, we haven't had any engagement. As of the time that we're writing, we're doing this, uh, uh, we haven't had, we haven't uh, uh, had anything at all from the ministry. Early on today, uh, I challenged on a statement, a joint statement by the Individual Bondholders Forum together with its uh, interested parties. Uh, essentially, you're giving government an ultimatum to make payment uh, within the next two days. Uh, why have you had to go that hard on government? Well, uh, we, we believe government is going to pay. Uh, but maybe there are some few challenges, administrative uh, issues that we are handling dealing with because the promise was to do it uh, last uh, yesterday. So if you couldn't do it yesterday and you are giving three more days, that is today, Wednesday and Thursday, to make uh, good your promise, I think it's, it's, it's fair uh, that uh, we are giving that to government. Rightfully so. Uh, we've also picked indications uh, from our sources at the finance ministry that they're beginning to process payments. Uh, just in case you don't receive your payments uh, before uh, on, uh, on the ultimatum deadline, what will you do? Yeah, that, that's fine. If that is, that is happening or that is going to happen, and I, as I said, I believe uh, that that is going to happen. Uh, the government says, I haven't seen cited the, the statement. Red government sees uh, these comments, uh, uh, the processes for payment of these outstanding, that is fine. Uh, the only challenge I have with how government is handling this is the information flow. Government is in the financial market, and government should know that there are some rules in the financial market. The market dictates certain things that must be done. And so if the government is Cleaning in that market, the government must conform with those, uh, the details of the market. If you cannot pay, you promise that you pay on the 13th, and you could not leak it. You don't have to wait for the 13th to relax for another day to come before you come up with a statement. Government should have come out with a statement, let's say Friday, or the, the latest Monday morning uh, to come the market and investors and say uh, this, everybody knows what is happening, but not to wait for people to start questioning. I get that, Dr. Uh, Anani Entry, but my question to you is, in the most unlikely circumstance that government is able to make payments on or before 
uh, your ultimatum deadline, what would you do? I, 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 I still think that the government, once they say they have started, then the process will be completed before the, 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 the deadline. It, it shouldn't take more than three days to go through those processes to pay us. So if the, the statement is saying they have started the process, then definitely it will be paid before the close of day on, on, on uh, uh, Thursday. All right, I thank you, uh, Dr. Anani Entry uh, is with the uh, Pensioner Bondholders Forum uh, reacting to the latest uh, situation where government is yet to make payments on their matured bonds. Let's continue with the rest of our stories. And a dawn raid by the Ghana Armed Forces in response to the killing of a soldier has raised an age-old question, why always a shaman? Godwin Asidiba tries to find answers amid horror tales of army brutality and residents constantly caught living in fear. On assignment on TV3, we bring you a set. The street of Ashaiman is one of the busiest at night. Critters here take the opportunity of the crowd to cash in, but most of them are being robbed after sales by unknown thugs. Sometimes when the people close and they are going home, some of them are from work, they carry their bags on. You see the boys opening their bag. So immediately we see the boys opening their bag, we will shout, Hey, my bag, no, my bag, no, I'm oh, 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 oh. Some of them will run away. Some of them, they'll catch them and we will beat them. Majority of the crimes committed in here are pickpocketing of phones and money, selling of fake items, swindling and many more. But the assemblyman of the Ashaiman Municipal Assembly, Ni Ayiko Kabute, thinks otherwise. I don't think you can go to Accra Central and then be walking on the street alone at the time, uh, 12 a.m. You can't. You can't. Everywhere. So Ghana is like that. Uh, so we should know. If you are security conscious, there are some of the times that you don't walk alone. So it's everywhere. The recent attack on the soldier comes as a shocker to him. But he condemned the actions by the military personnel deployed to the area and also called on the police to speed up their investigation. But the big question here, why always a shaman? People are still perceiving a, a shaman as the same old Ashama that they knew in the past, or the name that they've heard in the past, they still think that Ashama is the same Ashama. Yes, we all admit that in the past, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 70s, uh, crime rate at Ashama has always been in ascendancy. But as we speak now, it has reduced drastically. Find out on a shaman and a siege, which airs on Wednesday, March 15, on the assignment at 9 p.m. A shaman at night, full of life, energy, and many residents say, getting dangerous. And many others argue, full of people grossly misunderstood and duly stereotyped and branded as violent miscreants. If you be a nobody should say Ashama people are like, uh, this is, are criminals, it's not true. My name is Godwin Asidiba, and on this edition of The Assignment, I will examine how a community's notoriety, perceived or real, has been in a nation's focus after the murder of a 21-year-old soldier and the Ghana Army's brutal. Heavily criticized, some say disproportionate reaction. A Shaiman and the Siege airs on Wednesday, March 15 on TV3 and on all our digital media platforms at 9 p.m. Do make a date with us tomorrow. And the issue of a chairman came up in Parliament when minority members took on the president over his inability to mention the chairman killings and abuse in his State of the Nation address. Debating the address, the NDC MPs criticized the president for failing to unify the country in the address, but NPP MPs touted the records of government. Building infrastructure, whether health infrastructure, whether educational infrastructure, whether roads infrastructure, the president is working very hard to ensure that Ghanaians get development at the doorstep. 
We have been told by the president when he was complaining, just like me, he was whining and lamenting about the issue, and he never provided any solution when he appeared on the floor of the House. Mr. Speaker, on Saturday, we heard that Ghana has taken delivery of some buses, but what they didn't add was that these buses were coming from Nigeria. Mr. Speaker, these buses were coming from Nigeria. Of course, I have absolutely no problem if FDA confirms that these are good buses. But Mr. Speaker, the bigger question is that how come Nigeria has excess buses and we don't have? How come that Nigeria has excess buses and we don't have the buses? The buses that we are taking delivery of can only last for six weeks. When they brought a policy to curtail Tumso, they said we should put off our deep freezers. They said we should use one mobile phone. They said we should not be charging phones anyhow. That, that was the way that they wanted to handle a challenge that emanated from the country. Mr. Speaker, at that time, borders were not closed. At that time, ports were not closed. At that time, we were not asked to stay in our rooms. But they were struggling. We were still struggling to handle this issue. Mr. Speaker, as Commander-in-Chief of our Armed Forces, the President was duty-bound to say a word about the Sherman as Commander-in-Chief because rights had been violated, including the murder of a soldier. Mr. President did simply just didn't find space in the one and a half hours delivery to at least console the family of the bereaved soldier and also to express regret about the abuses of the rights of the people of Ashaba. Mr. Speaker, that was unfortunate. The President simply did not live up to expectation as Commander-in-Chief and I would admonish him to find space and address the nation on Boko and Ashama. Now, there was a mad rush for childhood vaccines at various health centers in Accra following the start of distribution. Mothers who have expressed relief after months of waiting are hopeful they will not have to experience such a phase of uncertainty once again. My colleague Judith Hawatritando did some checks at the Osu and Mamprobi polyclinics and reports. It's day two since the distribution of vaccines started at various health facilities. And of course, it's a busy day here at the Osu Maternity Home. Mothers have massed up in their numbers in search for vaccines for their babies. And of course, they are being administered these vaccines kindly. For them, the struggle over the past two to three months was not at all an easy tax. And they are finally relieved that the vaccines have arrived. I, I didn't want her to fall sick. It's my first child and I don't, I'm very, very particular about whatever happens to her because um, I don't want anything to happen to her then it will cause me pain or grief in my marriage because I just got married. So I really want the best for my child. So now I'm, I'm quite relieved that she has the vaccine and she can grow the way she's supposed to. The way they were saying it, that it came yesterday, but they are now trying to distribute it, the various hospitals, but I was not sure. So I came here today, I asked them and they told me that it's in. Oh, I'm happy. I'm happy. Very, very happy. The Mamprobi Polyclinic was not any different. Mothers can now heave a sigh of relief after months of interruption due to shortages. I was wondering because um, maybe if um, they said tuberculosis or something on the, sh um, the shoulder, something I have to come for. So I was, I was thinking that maybe hey, if my son catch up with tuberculosis at this tender age, what am I going to do? I feel happy because it, it has saved my time, the stress in carrying the baby, coming to the clinic alone, going up and down. I feel okay now. Health officials at the polyclinic are hopeful more vaccines will be provided as promised since the current stock, they say, will last for three months. It's enough, at least to cover up. I'm sure up to the 
middle of the year, the um, Minister for Health says that more is coming. So we know that we'll be having more consignment and so we'll be able to take care of our babies throughout the year and beyond. Currently, most health facilities are stocked with polio, measles, BCG and OPV vaccines. Judith Amitritanda, TBT News, Accra. Still on the vaccines, the World Health Organization is urging government to put in place measures to curtail shortages. The country representative, Dr. Francis Casolo, made the observation on the sidelines of a global meeting on improving maternal, newborn and child care in Accra. It's always worrying when there are stockouts, but fortunately, uh, the Ghana Health Service and government were up to the task and uh, as you saw, uh, the vaccines came in. I must also add that Ghana has performed exceedingly well in the area of immunization and that uh, the short stockouts do not normally affect the long-term picture in terms of uh, uh, the performance in terms of immunization coverage. Uh, for the last uh, uh, decade, Ghana has sustained the uh, immunization coverage well over 95 percent. So the short-term shortages would not affect that. But uh, if they are sustained in terms of the period, then we get worried. But for now, I think we are getting back to normal and hopefully this was a one-off uh, experience. I think what is important is just for us all to, from the facility levels, to be up to date with what we have in stock and report it in a timely manner so that action is taken um, as soon as possible. But it's something that uh, the, we are aware the system is trying to, the health system is trying to develop and that is ensuring timely reporting of uh, the stock levels from all levels of the health system so that uh, when they reach a critical level, we then move ahead and uh, as a country order new stock. Now, two pre-tertiary unions in education have criticized the education minister over his threat to close down non-performing schools. The Ghana National Association of Teachers and the Coalition of Consent Teachers have rather asked the education minister to provide adequate resources to the non-performing schools and facilitate the payment of the capitation grant and other subventions. The Minister of Education, Dr. Yaose Edichum, would rather have non-performing schools closed down than being a waste of the time and resources of the state and parents. But the Communication Director of the Coalition of Concerned Teachers, Adukwe Awule, says the Education Minister cannot close down non-performing schools. Measure the performance of a, of a school, like a La Presec and then Legon Presec. You cannot put them on the same pedestal and measure them accordingly. And then purport that one of them is not performing well, so you close down the school. You find teachers sitting under a tree, and that is their self common room. The, the head teacher's office is like an end coop, excuse me to say, where you find the students also in an uncompleted structure as classrooms. In spite of this, they are, they are, they are performing. He charged the education minister to rather close down schools under trees. He has no power to close down schools. How can where which you have power to close down schools? Even we have schools under trees. They are still managing. Teachers are there teaching. Teachers have dedicated themselves to go to villages where officers will not even go there to inspect those schools. But those schools are running. They, they go around to beg parents to bring to allow their children to come to school. Those schools are even still there. He should go and close down those schools first. The General Secretary of the Ghana National Association of Teachers, NAT, Thomas Musatanko, says the country's education policy document empowers regional education directors to determine a non-performing school and report to the GES Council. Then the GES Council will advise the sector minister to take action. You have set aside the GES Council. You have set aside the Director General. You have set aside the regional directors and you have descended on the heads and you are holding them accountable that they should come and they say that if they don't change the trend, you close down their schools. That is totally misplaced. That is not where that particular statement should go. He asked the education minister, Dr. Yao Ose Educhum, to rather focus on facilitating payment of captation grants and subventions. Sources that must go. Capitation grant is in arrears for two years. Subvention for the past three years have not gone. Over three years it has not gone. 
the same schools you are talking about, those who go there, and like I have said, they are aggregated 30, 31, 32. With all due respect to those students, you go and put them together in one place. And you say the hell should do what? Magic. What do you do? Please. Uh, we think that the minister sometimes should consult. In more news tonight, the University of Professional Studies, Accra, has commissioned a new hostel to brief up student accommodation. The facility, which is the university's third, is in honor of the designer of Ghana's coat of arms, Ni Amonokote. The 1,664 capacity hostel has study rooms, a recreational area, modern elevator, television rooms, laundry, among others. The Vice Chancellor of the University of Professional Studies, Abednego Fehi Uko Amate, is optimistic the facility will enhance students' comfort and studies. As a Vice Chancellor, I know how important it is to provide a safe shelter and environment for our students. I appreciate the fact that the provision of a holistic education goes beyond a serene lecture hall, faculty, and the provision of books. It is for this reason that the university has invested in infrastructural development, including this new hostel C, to meet the accommodation needs of students. The Minister of Education, Yao Se Duchum, commended the university for single handedly funding the project and urged others to follow suit. Indeed, this institution, progressive and resilient nature in funding this project is one to be emulated by all tertiary institutions in Ghana. The earlier two hostel projects and this current one bring the total student bed capacity to 4,584, and our UPS's support and response to government free senior high school program. The facility has a reliable security system to ensure safety of students and other occupants. A reminder, you're still watching News 360. This is our major news bulletin for the day. We're going to go for a short break. When we return, we've got the very latest in business news with Della Michelle. Time now for the latest in the world of business news with Della Michelle. And we head straight to Parliament. What happened there? Minority is reacting to some questions that yeah. we here at Three Business did post just last week with regard to um, a Russian vessel that was on the shores. Give us the detail. <laughs> My name is Della Michelle. Let's now begin with the minority in Parliament as it's asking government to come clean on allegations if purchased Russian fuel under the Gold for Oil program. A Russian oil tanker carrying 600,000 barrels of crude has been hiding off Ghana's coast, according to Bloomberg. Speaking to the media, the member of Parliament for Bongo, who is also a member of the Mines and Energy Committee, Edward Bauer, said the government may have to provide information or risk incurring the of the West, which Ghana needs a bailout for. Some of the OMCs, like Total, Shell, these are Western countries, who have been given explicit instructions not to do anything with, uh, what do you call it, uh, with uh, uh, Ru uh, Russia. And therefore, even in terms of their product, you can't commingle their products, as long as the product is coming from that. Two, the general uh, stance of government of Ghana and the state Ghana since independence up to now has been one of non-alliance. It's one of non-alliance that we do not belong to the West, we do not belong to the East, we do not align. By the very action of government now, what is our foreign policy? What is the implications of this on our negotiations on the IMF? And we are working on getting reactions from government. When we do that, we'll share with you in our subsequent broadcast. But away from that, investments within the upstream oil and gas industry have seen a remarkable decline in the last few years, partly owing to regulatory bottlenecks. That's according to the executive director of the African Center for Energy Policy, Benjamin Boache. According to him, various actions by policymakers over the years has made it extremely unattractive for investments within the industry. 
Speaking on TV3's business forecast, the ASA boss said many of the gains made since oil discovery in 2008 seem to have been eroded by the actions of politicians and those with the power to effect changes. Ghana's energy minister, Matthew Pocoprempe, is currently in Barcelona urging investors and decision makers to explore opportunities in Ghana's energy sector for the mutual benefit. According to the minister, Ghana and Africa have become suddenly a hotspot for oil and gas activities. But Benjamin Boachi says the actions of policymakers have made the industry unattractive. The Ministry of Energy and Petroleum Commission have done many roadshows trying to get investors into the country. But the basic thing is that we have to do it back home. Well, we are not doing them. Uh, all right, There are investors here that we need to even engage uh, for them to explore and produce more oil, they struggle to rather get clearance and basic approvals that they need to get. Government as part of measures to boost its revenue has imposed a national fiscal stabilization levy which would affect 1% of gross production for mining firms and upstream oil and gas companies. Benjamin Boachi said this new policy will be resisted by oil firms. When you want to impose laws that impacts people uh, in ways that they never imagined or they never anticipated. Your first point of call is to engage those people, to even first of all test the implication of that on the production processes. You cannot pass a law that makes it difficult to produce gold. You can't pass a law that makes it difficult to produce oil. So you need to engage to see how much they can part with. Let's now shift our focus to tax expert Francis Timoboy, who's arguing that the revised toll charges would not be enough to boost the country's road infrastructure. The government reintroduced road tolls and increased the rate by an average of 88% across the board. But Francis Timoboy argues that the rate is still inadequate to generate enough to finance meaningful road projects. He was speaking to Three Business. If you look at the amount of money or investment that is required for the various road networks, the expansion that are needed, um, one CD, one CD 50 pesos, and even you consider a truck paying like three CDs, for me, it's inadequate. The big trucks could be charged, let's say, 10 CDs, because these, these heavy trucks, they cause so much damage to the road. One truck loaded, I mean, how much is even a cement today to patch the road? So we need to pay the realistic amount. And again, after we have paid it, we don't want to see the, 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 the current situation of the Mamoto way. It's so bad, you, cannot, you need to be so careful, otherwise you're going to kill yourself. The traffic is so much. We pay the realistic amount. Government should use the money to fix the road. And that's how we wrap up the business news right here on News 360. Log on to 3news.com for more business news. My name is Della Michelle. Sports News is after this break. Stay with us. Welcome to the entertainment news segment. My name is Anita Ikia Ikufu. And in commemorating the Women History Month, the U.S. Embassy and the Gothe Institute and Alliance Francais in Accra have jointly held a film festival to honor and celebrate the achievements of women in film. Usu Arai has the details. The Women in Motion Film Festival, Eight Nights of Films, started on March 8, 2023 in Accra to scream films for about and by women. Hosted by the United States Embassy, Alliance Francaise, and the Gothe Institute's Ghana, the film festival and panel discussions was held to commemorate the International Women's Day and Women's History Month. And so we really looked at sort of what the catalog uh, films offered and thought about what films would resonate with women here as well as in our own country. So we looked at themes, everything from economic independence, migration, motherhood, political independence. And yeah, so these were all themes that we thought really complemented each other well and explored different facets of what it means to be a woman today. Short films including Madame's Cravings and The Consequences of Feminism by Alice Guy, from the reports of the security guards and patrol services part one by Hale Xander, from Germany and Black Barbie by Ghanaian British filmmaker Comfort Arthur, was screened on day one of the festival. 
Director of the Goethe Institute, Helg Frizel, said the initiative is to inspire women to work harder to achieve greatness. I mean, if you see the numbers, for example, in Germany, like in the banks, in the boards of banks, it's 10% women. In the big uh, companies, it's like 10 to 15 maybe percent women. And all the other are men still. We have to change that. I would like to say uh, we should not think that we reached where we want to come. And we should and we have to go on fighting for what we want, and, but in a, in a constructive way. Mibroni Ba, a 22-minute film by Ghanaian-American filmmaker Akosia Adoma Uusu was also screened. Let's support women in film, African women in film, women all over the world doing film. Um, the, the woman's gaze through film is a very important part of telling the African story, of telling the world story, telling our history. So women in film is very important. And the final day, the 17th of March, is actually going to be happening at Alliance Francaise. We're going to be screening The Woman King. Um, so definitely um, pass through as well. When Women Speak, a documentary film about the life work and contributions of Ghanaian women activists to national development will be screened on March 15th at the U.S. Embassy Commissary. Ghanaian filmmaker Asiye Tamaklo is the director and producer of When Women Speak. This project is supposed to actually fill the gap of women's stories that do not really exist. This project is to state that women have always been part of history making in Ghana, development, everything. Because the world has a way of writing women out of history. To some more stories, for 24 years, Easter Gospel Show Harvest Praise has drawn Christians and non-Christians together to praise and worship under a serene atmosphere. The 25th edition of the annual Harvest Praise headlines are renowned international gospel singer Don Moyen, Moses Bliss and Harvest Gospel Choir on Good Friday, April 7. Where there seems to be no wind. Running for 24 years, the Easter Gospel Show, Harvest Praise, is here again. Aside bringing together prolific gospel musicians and Christian folks under one praises and worship umbrella, the show targets evangelism as part of its core mandate. Our hearts are filled with a lot of gratitude to God because we sometimes ask ourselves how we made it for 25 years and we can only give the praise to God. It's been one year after the other, one challenge after the other, one mountain after the other for us to be able to scale. And um, it has been a testimony of God's faithfulness. I know that uh, he will continue to uh, make this outreach what it was birthed to be. For the 25th edition, Harvest Praise is featuring a renowned international gospel singer, Don Moen, Moses Bliss and Harvest Gospel Choir on Good Friday, April 7th at the University of Professional Studies Accra UPSA Auditorium. Like all other years, you will not be disappointed. We have all the way from Nigeria, Moses Bliss of Bigger Everyday fame. And all the way from the United States of America, we have Minister Don Moen. In a bid to push the Ghanaian gospel music onto the global stage, Harvest Praise, organized by Harvest International Ministries, is to unveil a new record label as part of its legacies for the 25th anniversary. Reverend Fitzgerald Odonko is the president of Harvest International Ministries. You know, that's really the great legacy that we want to bequeath to the Christian gospel scene, uh, not only in Ghana, probably in Africa. And, um, that is the next level that God is leading us on to. That we will provide, as it were, a crucible for gospel artists to find refuge and to find an instrument or a, a means by which their music will reach the world and they wouldn't be laden with the burden of marketing and uh, promises broken. Definitely looking forward to this one. My name is Anita Ikuya Ikufu, and that will be your for entertainment. Up next is International News. Good evening. At least 190 people are now confirmed dead in Malawi after Tropical Storm Freddy ripped through Southern Africa for the second time in a month. Terrifying amounts of brown water have cascaded through neighborhoods, sweeping away homes. Malawi's commercial hub, Blantyre has recorded most of the deaths, 158, including 36 in a landslide. 
The government has declared a state of disaster in 10 southern districts that have been hardest hit by the storm. Rescue workers are overwhelmed and are using shovels to try to find survivors buried in mud. The government's disaster relief agency said the death toll had risen from 99 on Monday to 190, while about 584 people were injured and 37 were still missing. More than 20,000 people have been displaced. Well, that's how we conclude News 360, our major news bulletin for the day. Thanks very much for watching. My name is Parker Chiasari. For more stories, do well to log on to our website, www.3news.com. And I am Portia Gabo. Remember, we have Ghana tonight with Alfred Okanse at 10. Have a lovely evening.